Let's stay standing for the reading of God's word. Our text for tonight is John chapter 4. Verse 24, this is the word of the Lord, it is eternally true. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we pray as we look into your word that you would bless our minds, that you would illumine our minds and our hearts to understand your word, to know you. Father, and knowing you, Father, I pray that we would uh, obey and follow all that you command. For the glory of your Son, Jesus, in whose name we pray, amen. Amen. Be seated. Well, when I get the chance to preach in the evening services, and others will be preaching as well, but when I get the chance, I'm going to do a series on the attributes of God. And so our first tonight is God is Spirit. <clears throat> and really, my motivation in preaching on the attributes of God is to get us to love God, to be, um, to be meditating upon His glory night and day, right? On His character. And we need to know God in order to set our minds upon Him. We need to know how he has revealed himself in scripture uh, to truly love and honor him properly. And so that's, that's my goal in these sermons. It really is to rejoice in who God is. It, it is a sad fact of, of our makeup and the, the remaining indwelling sin on, in us that we so quickly forget who God is. I mean, we can open up the the Word of God, and be taught and forget within hours just what we learned about our Heavenly Father. And so the more that we uh, are forced to uh, think upon Him and settle in our minds just who He is, uh, the better off we will be. So God is Spirit is our first one this evening. Of course, you may know that the Westminster uh, catechisms answer the question, what is God, with uh, that statement, God is a spirit. God is a spirit. Who, any of the children here, what is God? Can you give the rest of the answer? God is a spirit. No, not the shorter catechism. That's the children's catechism. Thank you, though. We'll get there. What is God? God is a spirit, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable. Oh, man. I shouldn't have asked. And his being, wisdom, um, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. Right? Did I get it in the right order? Somebody check me? Yeah. God is a spirit, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable. And his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. So that first statement, God is a spirit, God is a spirit, while the Westminster larger catechism has this longer answer, very similar to the shorter catechism, it's trying to, it's trying to open up those uh, incommunicable and communicable attributes of God, the things that he is in and of himself and doesn't share with us, and then the other attributes where he does share those with us. In the larger catechism, question seven, God is a spirit in and of himself, infinite in being, glory, blessedness, and perfection, all-sufficient, eternal, unchangeable, incomprehensible, everywhere present, almighty, knowing all things, most wise, most holy, most just, most merciful and gracious, long-suffering, and abundant in goodness and truth." And we say amen to all those things about the one true living God. We we need to strive, again, to put this before us. We need to strive to know know this glorious God so we can fully enjoy him. There is no enjoying of things that we don't know or understand. We don't enjoy things that are 
are obscure to us. Now, there's a, there's a part of God, he is far above us. There's a, he is incomprehensible, as it said. Right? We will never plumb the depths of the, the attributes of God. Even in a glorified state, we'll, we will still be learning of God all the time and every day. But he has also revealed himself to us. He's revealed himself to us through nature. He's revealed himself to us through the word of God. And so we can know him in order to enjoy him. And that task should be, it really should be our delight, right? To, to enjoy God, to know the Heavenly Father. That should be our delight. We are delighted by many things in this life. We are delighted by the love of a woman. We are delighted by food, right? We are delighted by the sunsets and the sunrise. We are delighted by a vacation, and it's hard for us, unfortunately, in our busy lives to be delighted by our God. Perhaps part of that is because we don't see him. We don't see him, and the reason we don't see him is he is spirit. He is spirit. God is spirit. Um, and so as we know him, as we grow in our knowledge of him, we will trust him more fully, we'll be able to live by faith. But it's difficult because we have not seen God. <clears throat> we have seen his self-description in the scriptures. That's what we get. But we have not seen God before us. But God is invisible. God is spirit. He does not have a body like we do. And so that's where... That's where we have to start. <clears throat> God is spirit, John 4, 24. And so that, that's a point-blank statement of God being a spirit. It's the only point-blank statement of God being a spirit in all of Scripture, John 4, 24. It's the one time it's stated. Um, but all of the rest of Scripture testifies to this fact with various descriptions of God. Um, Bavink says that the old, that the spirit, spirituality of God is presupposed in the Old Testament and is explicitly taught in the New Testament. And uh, that seems very clear. And so what does it mean that God is a spirit? What does it mean? And, and is that how you conceive of God? Is that when you think of God, this is what the larger and the shorter catechism led off with. God is a spirit. That's the first thing. Is that how you think of God? God being a spirit. Well, first of all, it means he does not have a body. He is not a body. And all of you are thinking, yeah, but Jesus has a body. Okay, that's true. The second person of the Trinity assumed the flesh. But before he assumed the flesh, the Son of God was a spirit because God is spirit, right? Right? Um, God, by nature, is very different from us in this. We are flesh. We have a body. He is non-corporeal spirit. He does not have a body. Calvin says, God can no more agree with the flesh than fire with water. That's the way he puts it. And so God's being cannot be explained by by science. He is not of the substance of creation. That is not what God is. God was a spirit before there was any substance because he created all substance. He created everything visible and invisible. But he existed as spirit before that and spirit has no substance, at least created substance. The essence of God is that he is spirit. Scripture says God, why does scripture always seem to describe God as if he has body parts, right? It says that God has a heart, he has intestines, he has eyes, he has hands. Um, these are ways that scripture is lisping to us, right? It's like coming down to our level so that we can begin to understand something about God. Right? If it just said God is spirit, he doesn't have a body, he has no substance, we'd be like, whoa. 
you know, and his actions would be hard for us to conceive of. So scripture comes along and lists to us so that we can understand some of the works of God, and that's why it, it uses anthropomorph I'll say it, anthropomorphisms, right? That is ascribing body parts to him, but he, he is spirit. He does not have a body like men. And that's so we can come to understand him on some level. Um, and so it uses body parts to describe his actions, but he is a spirit, okay? It uses those, that language of body parts to describe his actions. But scripture does not assign to God a body anywhere. <clears throat> Charnock, the, um, Stephen Charnock, he wrote the big fat book that most of us haven't read that's on our shelves. Um, or we've gone into it a few times for reference, uh, The Existence and Attributes of God. Really excellent uh, work. He says this, and for this, I'm, I'm old, so i got to use... My notes are too... I wrote my notes, and they're too small for my eyes. It's, it's wrong. So that the notion of a spirit is that it is a fine, immaterial substance an active being that acts itself and other things, a mere body cannot act itself. As the body of man cannot move without the soul, no more, no more than a ship can move itself without wind and waves, so God is called a spirit as being not a body wholly separate from anything of flesh and matter. And so like, like with us, we have a body and a soul Without the soul, the body would do nothing. Without the body, the soul would be nothing, right? But with God, he is a spirit, and he doesn't rely on this compound that we have, and he still can act and act fully, okay? He, he, is, he can act in and of himself, okay? And so that's the first thing. He is not made of stuff. That's what it means that God is a spirit. It's not made of stuff. He is God who is spirit. Now, what does that mean? If God is a spirit, we have some therefores, and we could go to um, the first one is that he is self-existent, right? If we went to Exodus, Exodus 3 at 13... Then Moses said to God, Behold, I am going to the sons of Israel, and I will say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now, they may say to me, What is his name? You know, in asking what is his name, they want to know what he is like. Right? What is his name? What's he, what's he like? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. So God is self-existent. We could go to Psalm, and this, this is because he is spirit, right? Psalm 90 says, the first part of Psalm 90, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were born, or you gave birth to the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. And so that he is a spirit, he is eternal. He's omnipresent because he is a spirit and he's not located in a body, right? He is omnipresent. We can go to one, Psalm 139, right? Um, you remember this. You've searched me and know me. You know when I sit down, when I rise up. You understand my thought from afar. You scrutinize my path and my lying down even before there was a word on my tongue. You remember this. Where can I go from your spirit, verse 7, or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I, make, if I make my bed in Sheol, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the dawn, if I dwell in the remotest part of the sea, even there your hand will lead me, and your right hand will lay hold of me. If I say, surely the darkness will overwhelm me, and the light around me will be, like, will be night, even the darkness is not dark to you, and the night is as bright as the day. Darkness and light are alike to you. And so he is omnipresent. Being a spirit, he is everywhere present. He is, um, let's see, Isaiah 
40, verse 18, To whom then will you liken God, or what likeness will you compare with him? In other words, he's incomparable. God is incomparable. There is nothing to compare with God. He is he's a one-off, right? He, he is incomparable with anything else. And then Exodus 33, back in Exodus 33 at verse 20. We read this, but God said to Moses, you cannot see my face for no man can see me and live. So he's invisible. He can't be seen. He is the invisible God. The spirit, the spirit cannot be seen. He's invisible. Um, and then we'll throw this one in as well. He's unpicturable. He's unpicturable because he's a spirit. You cannot draw him. You cannot make an image of him. He is unpicturable. Um, Exodus 20, verse 4, You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water beneath the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children, on the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. So he is unpicturable. We could also go to uh, Deuteronomy <clears throat> Chapter 5, verse 8. You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is on heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. Right? The restatement of the Decalogue. And so, he's self because he is spirit, he's self-existent, he's eternal, he's omnipresent, he's incomparable, he's invisible and unpicturable. Which is amazing. Which is enough for you to filter through your brain for half a century and meditate on. He is without form. There are many passages in the New Testament that you are, you are aware of. John 1.18, for example, that says that God is <clears throat> invisible. He cannot be seen. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. Okay? We could go to Romans 1, we could go to Colossians 1, we could go to 1 Timothy 1 and 6, we could go to 1 John 4. All of these speak of God being invisible. And so Bobbing summarizes some of these things and he says, God is a unique substance distinct from the universe, immaterial, imperceptible to the human senses, Without composition or extension. Now, no one knows what those things mean. Without composition means he's not made up of different parts, like us, body, soul. He doesn't have parts. He's one thing, and it's spirit. right? And without extension means that he doesn't have dimensions. He doesn't have length and width and height. He, he doesn't have that. He's everywhere. He's all length and all height, right? There's, there's no extension, there's no composition. Now, does this mean God is a soul? Is that what we mean when we say that God is a spirit? God is a soul, or that our souls are like God's spirituality? And the answer to that is no, it is not like that, okay? Bavink again, God's spirituality is unique, and when we use the term spirit, we must be careful that we do not apply it to God, angels, and souls in the same way synonymously. The spirituality of God refers to that perfection of God that describes him negatively as being immaterial and invisible, analogously to the spirit of angels and the souls of humans, and positively as the hidden, simple, uncompounded, absolute ground of all cultural, somatic, and pneumatic being. Cultural means creaturely, somatic means of the body, pneumatic means of the spirit, right? And so he's the absolute ground. And so there's an analogy between soul and spirit, but to speak of God as spirit is to speak of him as he is in and of himself. There is, there is really no 
no um, comparison. So that's a start to what it means that God is spirit. It's hard work to study the attributes of God, right? It's hard to, these are hard concepts. I mean, when was the last time you, you thought about God not having any extension, right? Well, you did tonight. Go tell your friends, right? But God as spirit is, is essential, and I want to make a few applications in thinking about this. Now, of course, what you're thinking about in all of this is the incarnation of Christ. At least that's where my mind went. What about the body of Christ? What about the humanity and divinity? What about Christ, and we, we say, assuming the flesh? Well, yeah, you should be in awe of the fact that God, who is spirit, took on the flesh. That should just, it's, I, I can't explain that to you. I cannot, I cannot come close to describing the, the mechanics of that. No one can, right? Even the incarnation of Christ in Scripture, it's like the Holy Spirit came upon her and you will have a child. It doesn't give us the mechanics of that. But we should be in awe of the fact that God the Son assumed human flesh and so had and actually now has dimensions and extension Right? He is, the Son of God somehow is locked into space. And yet God is spirit. Omnipresent, invisible, uh, incomprehensible. And so don't ask me to explain the incarnation. You should be in awe of the mystery of the incarnation especially when you understand God's spirituality, the fact that he took on flesh, and he did so not because he thought, wow, this will be fun. Let me condescend so far that I take on the flesh and get a, and get a cold during the winter. No, he did it so that he could represent you. He did it so that he could die in your place and so that God could be just and the justifier. Right? Not just saying, ah, I forgive you, but he could actually punish every sin that has ever been committed by his people. And so be in awe of the fact that this, the God who is spirit took on the flesh. Um, that should fill you with praises and uh, song. Second ac- application is this. Do not worship images. Do not worship images. This is John 4.24. John 4.24 says, God is spirit, therefore those who worship him must worship him in images? No, in spirit and by the word, in truth. Right. So do not worship him with images. Uh, Boving says, maintaining our confession that God's nature is spiritual is a unique way, in a unique way, is very important because the whole character of our worship and service of God rests on it. Worship in spirit and truth is based on the spirituality of God. It alone, in principle and forever, spells the elimination of all image worship. The spirituality of God eliminates image worship as even... Uh, approximating, coming close to the type of worship that God would have for him. It always misrepresents his nature. It always misrepresents his nature. Even pictures of Christ misrepresent his nature because they only represent his humanity and they do not deal with the fact that he is spirit and he is deity. Three, Another application. Be in awe that the spirituality of God means he is eternal, unbounded, omnipresent, and invisible, which means God is everywhere present in all of his fullness. God everywhere is fully there. God everywhere is absolutely, positively, fully there in all. All of his power 
in all of his being. Which means, listen to this, remember this, because God is everywhere present, he is always available in his power for you. He's always available to you. He is always near to you. And you, you can call upon the omnipotent God and he will hear you and he will be with you and he will fight your battles for you because he is spirit and he is everywhere present. First Peter 1.8, and though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. We rejoice and we revel in, the, in a God we've never seen, in a God who cannot be seen. We revel in that. We love him, right? God is not visible because he is hidden. That's what I want you to understand. God is, God is, is not visible because he's hidden or he's keeping away from you. That's not why he's hidden. He is not visible because it is his nature to not be visible. He is spirit. But that means he is always present for you. And yet, in his kindness, he allows us to see his power in what he created. He allows us to see his power in what he created. Think about how, how the creation, Psalm 19, um, Romans 1, 20, how in creation, we get to look on it and learn something about his attributes, his power. What a wonderful thing that he has done that for us. So he gives us things to look at in his creation, but we don't get to look at him because he can't be seen by flesh. And so we have eyes to see God in the word and in the book of nature. Fourth, I'll say this, um, fourth and last application from the, the truth that God is spirit. Spiritual things are better than bodily things. There I said it, just committed the Gnostic heresy and dualism. But I'll just use Charnock to, to prove it's a true statement. Spiritual things are better than bodily things. I mean, it's so self-evidently true, right? Um, look at our bodies. <laughs> Feel your joints, <laughs> right? Look at the decay of your bodies. But spiritual things are better than bodily things. Charnock said, spiritual substances are more excellent than bodily. The soul of man more excellent than other animals. Angels more excellent than men. They contain in their own nature whatsoever dignity there is in the inferior creatures. God must have, therefore, an excellency above all those and therefore is entirely remote from the conditions of a body. He's remote from these the, the conditions that were, were locked into space, that, that after the fall, especially, these bodies decay. So many today, um, following the materialist error, right, following the Darwinian materialist error, think that matter is all there is. Matter is all that matters, Right? Substance, what we can touch and feel and see is all that matters. But God is spirit. And those things that are unseen are, are older than those things that he created. He precedes them. Charnock says, God partakes of no body. He is pure spirit, but how do we act as if we were only matter and body? We have but little kindness for this quest, for this great spirit, as well as our own, if we take no care of his immediate offspring, since he is not only spirit, but the father of spirits. Right? And he's getting at the, he's getting at the fact that we're created in his image, that we have um, eternal spirits that will go on living even after the body dies. Right, But God has and never has had that body. 
And, and again, this isn't to get into the incarnation. There's not so much we can say about explaining the incarnation. But it is just amazing that this eternal God, three in one, one in three, took on the flesh, condescended so infinitely, entered time and space, which is a created part of, of our world, right? And did so so that you might eternally reside in the presence of a Holy Spirit. And so meditate on these things. Mull these things over in your mind. Really enjoy thinking about your God and, and your Creator. And think about the fact that He is a Spirit. Let's pray. Father, thank you for revealing yourself to us in your Word. We praise you that you are spirit and that you are, are free from all the, the boundaries that we feel. And Lord, we, we glorify you. We, we, we cannot understand these things. We are so bounded by our flesh, we, are, we, can't, we can't comprehend what it means for you to be a spirit before the worlds existed. And, and yet, Father, we pray that even the, the mystery of it, even the incomprehensible nature that you have would, would delight us. And so, Father, help us. Help us to search your scripture to understand who you are, knowing that we will not fully know until we are before you, and then still we will study to know. Father, we love you. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for your kindness to us in him. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.